Unit 1 Classical Conditioning by Pavlov Structure 1.0 Introduction Does your baby daughter start crying whenever she sees a man with big moustache? Does your brother fall helplessly in love with every lady who uses a particular perfume? The fear of your child, the blind attraction of your brother, may have at their basis, the principles of classical conditioning. Both of them may have been behaving precisely like Pavlov's dog. How did your daughter develop the fear? You may recall the incident when your uncle with a pair of long moustache visited your house. Holding your daughter in his big burly arms, he had bellowed, Hey there, my sweetie. Even you jumped up at the sudden sound. Your little girl was terrified and cried out in fear. Your uncle was a bit embarrassed and tried to soothe the baby. Now, no, no, no more crying, he roared. The baby now got so scared that you had to intervene and take her from the boisterous grandfather's arms. Since then she had been scared of any man who happens to have a bunch of bushy hair below his nose, causing your anxiety and your uncle's mortification. What had happened? The sudden loud sound caused a startled response in the baby generating the emotion of fear. Every time the frightening sound emerged, the baby. Classical conditioning by Pavlov. 5. Learning and Cognitive theories of personality. 6. Saw a pair of dancing bushy moustaches, the most prominent feature on your uncle's face. So this innocent growth of hair, the sign of pride for your uncle, became the sign of danger to your daughter. She anticipated the frightening roar whenever she encountered any man with moustache and cried even before the sound came. The fact that your daughter has thus acquired this new and uncomfortable association of the moustache and the sound is an instance of classical conditioning. But you can erase this learning, or put new learning in her also. In this unit, you will know about classical conditioning. Classical conditioning is one basic model of learning which was a landmark in the history of understanding behavior. The man behind it was a Russian physiologist named Ivan Petrovich Pavlov. In this unit, you will learn about Pavlov's basic experiment, the concepts emerging thereof, and the application of classical conditioning in personality theory and psychopathology. 1.1 Objectives L. After going through this unit, you should be able to Define classical conditioning L. 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 Describe Pavlov's experiment in classical conditioning Differentiate among unconditioned stimulus, unconditioned response, conditioned stimulus and conditioned response Draw a schematic diagram of classical conditioning experiment with its essential elements Explain the implications of Pavlov's classical conditioning in understanding personality, and Discuss the applications of classical conditioning in psychotherapeutic settings. 1.2 Concept of Classical Conditioning Classical conditioning is a learning paradigm from behavioral point of view. Consider any stimulus, S1, capable of eliciting a natural response, R1. Imagine any other neutral stimulus, S2, that does not elicit this particular response. Suppose within the experimental situation, these two stimuli, S1 and S2, are consistently presented together. After a few exposures of S1 and S2 together, the natural response to the first stimulus R1 would occur in the presence of the second stimulus S2 also, even if the first stimulus S1 is absent. Thus after conditioning, the second stimulus, originally incapable of eliciting the specific response, becomes capable of doing the same. Consider the example of the boisterous uncle. The loud voice was the natural stimulus S1 that elicited the natural fear response R1 in the child. The moustache was, originally, a neutral stimulus S2 incapable of eliciting fear. But, as it always accompanied the big sound, it gradually became capable of eliciting the fear, even when the sound was absent. The term classical conditioning is defined as learning by association, whereby a neutral stimulus, by virtue of its occurrence in close time and space with a natural stimulus that gives rise to a natural response, becomes capable of eliciting that natural response, even in absence of the natural stimulus. Classical conditioning is applicable only for reflexive and spontaneous responses, and not for voluntary responses. The phenomenon of classical conditioning was discovered by him in the course of his work during the turn of the last century. This was reported elaborately in his paper in 1927 and also illustrated in detail in 1928. In the following section we would study in more detail the best known experiment by Pavlov. 1.3 Pavlov's experiment on classical conditioning. 1.3.1 The experiment. Ivan Petrovich Pavlov 1849-1936 was a Russian physiologist. During the late 19th and early 20th century Pavlov and his associates were working in a laboratory at St. Petersburg on the digestive process of dogs. Pavlov was studying the gastric secretion of the dogs by placing meat powder in their mouth and measuring the saliva. For the sake of precision of measurement, Pavlov had arranged to give a signal of light or sound a bell just before placing the meat powder in the animal's mouth. However, after a few trials, unexpectedly, the dog started salivating in anticipation of meat powder. It began to salivate at the signal, light or sound, even before the meat powder had been given. Thus its salivary response, which should come naturally only after the meat powder touches the taste buds, started to be elicited by a neutral visual or auditory stimulus even before the meat powder was given. Pavlov also noted that the amount of salivation in response to the light or sound was less in amount than the salivation that occurred in response to meat powder. Pavlov was disturbed by the phenomenon. He considered this, psychic secretion, a hindrance to his scientific work. Later on, however, he attempted to explain the unexpected turn of affairs. Initially he tried to go by the introspective method and try to guess what the dog was thinking. Soon he abandoned this effort and emphasized on the association between the natural and neutral stimuli to interpret the findings. Before conditioning, food being shown to the dog, 
The dog salivates ring a bell, non-salivating dog during conditioning. Ring the bell, give the food. Dog salivates repeat this many times so that the dog is able to associate the bell with the food. And salivate after conditioning. Ring the bell, dog salivates. You can see the experiment by Pavlov in the internet by clicking HTTP. He tried out the above experiment in the same manner with a light also. That is light appearing just before the food is produced. However when the results were seen, Pavlov noticed as compared to the bell the response to light was not as strong. 1.3.2 Interpretation of the Results of the Experiment You must be aware by this time that the association between the food meat powder used by Pavlov and bell in time and place was crucial for the results that Pavlov obtained. The anticipatory salivation was not a natural response to the bell, but after classical conditioning by Pavlov. 7. 8. Learning and cognitive theories of personality the association was established, the dog elicited the saliva in response to the bell. Thus, it was a new learning for the dog. Pavlov identified four essential elements of the learning processes. They are, I unconditioned stimulus, UCS the natural stimulus that elicits a natural response. In Pavlov's experiment, the meat powder was the UCS. E unconditioned response, UCR the natural response elicited to the natural stimulus. In Pavlov's experiment, the salivation was the UCR. E conditioned stimulus, CS the neutral stimulus that does not naturally elicit the target response, but may do so after being associated with the UCS for a number of times. In Pavlov's experiment, the light or the sound of the bell was the CS. IV conditioned response CR the target response similar to the UCR that originally occurred to the UCS only, but after conditioning occurred to CS, even in absence of the UCS. In Pavlov's experiment, the salivation that occurred in response to the light or bell was the CR. You must remember here that the UCR and the CR are similar but not the same. Pavlov noticed that the amount of salivation was less in response to the light bell in comparison to the original salivation in response to meat powder. Box 1 before conditioning, UCS food, UCR, salivation, NS belt, no salivation during conditioning, CS belt, UCS food, UCR, salivation after conditioning, CS belt, CR, salivation, UCS unconditioned stimulus, UCR unconditioned response, NS neutral stimulus, CS conditioned stimulus, CR conditioned response. You must remember that classical conditioning is not limited to salivation and similar other anticipatory approach responses only. One may condition anticipatory withdrawal responses as well. Pavlov examined this phenomenon by delivering an electric shock to the paw of the dog. On each learning trial, the bell rang and the shock was delivered immediately after. The reflex of withdrawal of the paw, a natural response to the shock, now started to take place after the sound of the bell and before delivery of the actual shock. Box 2 before conditioning, an electric shock given to the dog, dog withdrawing its paw ring the bell, no withdrawal of the paw by dog during conditioning, ring the bell, give electric shock to the paw of the dog, dog withdraws its paw after conditioning, ring the bell, dog withdraws its paw. Pavlov used the term, acquisition, to denote the new learning. In classical conditioning the acquisition occurs due to temporal contiguity of the stimuli, or association in time. In the following section we would see how varying this association may influence the learned behavior, both UCR 1.3.3 principles of classical conditioning. Now you know that the food was given to the dog just after the light sound of the bell and conditioning resulted. Have you thought what would happen if the sound of the bell came after the food? Have you considered whether the bell would continue to elicit salivation if meat powder was not given to the dog for a number of times? After formulation of basic principles of classical conditioning, Pavlov engaged himself in exploring and illustrating some of principles of classical conditioning. In the following sections you would learn about some such principles. I. Reinforcement, you know that you can elicit a conditioned response by the pairing of CS and UCS. Since UCS meat powder comes later than CS bell, the presentation of CS alone elicits salivation. But you need to give the dog the UCS consistently after the bell. So here meat powder serves as the reinforcer, as it strengthens the bond between the CS and the UCR salivation in this case. Reinforcement is a very important concept in conditioning. Reinforcement refers to the presentation or removal of a stimulus to maintain or increase the probability of a target response. Reinforcement may be primary or secondary and positive or negative. Primary reinforcers are those that satisfy a basic need. The food in classical conditioning by Pavlov. 9. Learning and cognitive theories of personality. 10. Pavlov's experiment is a primary reinforcer. If the same experiment is conducted on a child and she is handed over a chocolate as her reward, that will be secondary reinforcer, as chocolates are not essential for survival. Secondary reinforcers are rewarding or punishing because they have been associated with a primary reinforcer earlier in time. A positive reinforcer is one that is pleasurable to the organism. A negative reinforcer is one which is unpleasurable to the organism. While food is a positive reinforcer to connect salivation with sound, electric shock might be a negative reinforcer to connect paw flexion with sound. Timing of reinforcement is important. It has been observed that the first few trials of the conditioning experiment are of special importance. The major bulk of acquisition occurs during this period. A plateau may be seen in the learning curve during the later trials. Also, the CS must proceed or occur almost simultaneously with the UCS. It loses much of its conditioning power if it is presented after the UCS. E. E. IV. Extinction, what will happen if you do not reinforce the association between the CS and UCS? In other words, after conditioning is established, you sound the bell but do not reward the dog by giving meat powder. You will observe that after a few such trials with no reinforcer, the salivation still occurs, but in a decreased amount. Gradually, as the unreinforced trials continue, the dog would stop salivating in response to the sound of the bell. What you have here is a case of extinction. 
the conditioned response has been made extinct, or in other words, the conditioning has taken place as a result of failure to reinforce the association. Spontaneous recovery, sometimes, after extinction, and after a time interval with no exposure to CS, the conditioned response may suddenly come back if the CS is given once again. The dog's salivation to the bell has been stopped. The bell has also not been sounded for a considerable time. If after this gap the bell is suddenly sounded, the dog may start salivating once again. Since this phenomenon of reappearance seems to appear from no known cause, it is referred to as spontaneous recovery. However, the intensity of this recovered response is usually less than the original response. After spontaneous recovery, if the CR is reinforced, the learning comes back. If reinforcement is still not given, permanent extinction may take place. Stimulus generalization, will the dog salivate only in response to the sound of the specific bell or to the specific light? Will it respond by salivating to other bells as well? Pavlov conducted further experiments to examine these questions. He initially made a standard UCSCS connection of food and a specific sound of a bell. On test trials, he substituted the original sound with other sounds varying in similarity. He found that the dog salivated to other sounds as well, but the amount of salivation was proportional to the similarity of the sound of the bell to the original CS. More similar the sound to the original CS, greater the amount of salivation, and less similar the sound, less is the salivation. This phenomenon is known as stimulus generalization. The dogs was not given any food is reinforced during test trails, that is no new association of the second sound with food was established. Generalization occurred spontaneously from the original learning trials. From the generalization to stimuli of different degrees of similarity with the original CS, a gradient of conditioned response can also be obtained. After conditioning the salivation of the dog to the sound of the bell, you can give another sound of the test trial, which is slightly different in pitch from the original bell. The amount of salivation will be slightly less than the conditioned response. If on another test trial you expose the dog to even another sound which is a bit more dissimilar to the original CS, the amount of salivation will be even less. Thus for successively less similar stimuli, decreasing amount of salivation will be obtained. You will get, as a result, a gradient of conditioned response. We, we. Discrimination, this is the opposite of generalization. You have learned that generalization occurs to stimuli similar to the CS. But if stimuli similar to the CS and eliciting the CR are presented repeatedly without ever being associated with the UCS, those stimuli will cease to elicit the CR, thus enabling discrimination between similar stimuli. Suppose the original CS is the sound of a bell that we call B. The dog learns to salivate to B, and also salivates to B1 and B2 through generalization. However, if B1 is systematically reinforced and B2 is not reinforced, then the dog will respond differentially to B1 and B2. It will salivate to B1 and not to B2. Counter conditioning, once conditioned, ever conditioned. Of course not, as you can extinct and acquire learning, you can also counter condition it by associating the CS with UCS of different nature. For example, you can first condition a dog to withdraw its paw at the sound of a bell, as a bell is systematically followed by a shock. Then you can counter condition it by systematically pairing the same sound to food. Now the dog may be conditioned to salivate to the sound of the bell. Self the cat has been subjected to a red light immediately before an electric shock. As a result it has learned to withdraw its paw when it sees the red light. Subsequently it has been exposed to a red light immediately before getting food. This is an example of I reinforcement, E counter conditioning, E discrimination, I V extinction. B. A rabbit has been exposed to a red light before being delivered a pellet of cabbage leaf. As a result it salivates to red light alone. Subsequently the experimenter wants to see if it can generalize its learning. Which of the following stimuli would be appropriate to demonstrate generalization? I cauliflower leaf, E blue light, E pieces of carrot, I V orange light. Classical conditioning by Pavlov. 11. Learning and Cognitive Theories of Personality 1.4 Implications of Pavlov's Classical Conditioning in Understanding Personality So far we had been dealing with dogs. But we started the chapter with your little daughter. How do we pass on from the dog's saliva to the baby's fear? How far this fear conditioned in your daughter may make her an anxious woman throughout her life. In this section, you will learn about the application of classical conditioning principles to complex human behavior and personality characteristics. Pavlov's lead was followed by a number of behaviorists. They conducted experiments with conditioning and deconditioning of various emotional and social behaviors. Among the earlier works in this direction, the most famous is the case of Little Albert reported by John Brodus Watson, 1878-1958. 1.4.1 Conditioned Emotional Responses, The Case of Little Albert A classic experiment conducted by John B. Watson and Rosalie Rayner in 1920. Watson was an ardent behaviorist and a critic of complex psychoanalytical explanation of emotion, Watson, 1913-1920. They worked with an 11-month-old boy called Albert. Watson and Rayner were able to instill fear of rats in the boy. Initially, Albert was not afraid of rats and used to play with rats fondly. Watson and Rayner exposed the boy to white rats and simultaneously made a very loud sound by the bang of a hammer on a suspended steel rod. The loud sound produced a startled response in the boy. After a series of such exposures, Albert showed signs of fear of rats. Gradually his fear was generalized to many other furry objects like rabbit, dog and also cotton balls. Watson and Rayner claimed that this experiment proved that irrational fear of apparently harmless things is not due to deep emotional complexes but owing to simple temporal association of fear-generating objects. Although you might think that the results are straightforward enough, actually there are few gaps. 
Later investigations suggested that Albert's fear was perhaps neither as strong as claimed, nor as much generalized. There was a gross ethical violation involved as well, at least by today's standard. Albert's fear was never the condition. The conditioning of irrational fear has been made. In 1924, Mary Cover Jones reported the conditioning of a three-year-old boy's fear of rabbit. This boy, called Peter, was exposed to other children who were not afraid of rabbits. The presence of rabbit was also associated in time with pleasurable activities and playful words. Gradually through a repeated association of rabbit with pleasant things, Peter could outgrow his fear. This experiment also paves the way for using classical conditioning principles in therapeutic setting. In the following section, we will learn about the classical conditioning of attitudes. 12. 1.4.2 Classical Conditioning of Social Attitude Classical Conditioning by Pavlov Suppose you meet a person for the first time in your life during a lunch session of workshop or a seminar. After a brief discussion, interaction, what are your reactions about the person? How do you judge the person? Exactly this question has been explored by Gregory Razrin in the late 30s. Razrin 1940 elicited the ethnic bias for or against certain photographs of women. Initially he found that his subjects rather disliked women of ethnic minority origin and considered Jewish women and intelligent and ambitious in comparison to the Italian women. However, when the subjects judged the same pictures during a nice free lunch, the differences in attitude reduced considerably. Razrin concluded that the positive association with food reduces the negative bias considerably. The modern management gurus have embraced the implications. They call it the luncheon technique. As you know, many business deals are finalized over a sumptuous dinner. Association of gastronomic pleasure increases the probability of looking at the proposal in a more positive way. 1.4.3 Psychopathological Conditions Explained by Classical Conditioning Pavlov himself attempted to explain experimental neurosis. In 1921 an experiment with dogs had been conducted by Shengel Krestovnikova. The dog was initially trained to respond by producing excitatory salivation to a circular stimulus. Then it was trained to produce inhibitory withdrawal response to an elliptical stimulus. Subsequently the difference between the circle and the ellipse were reduced. The dog reacted by howling and struggling, a behavior that resembles human psychopathology. Pavlov reasoned that the dog's neurosis was due to a collision of excitatory and inhibitory tendencies. More sophisticated explanation of psychopathology using the classical conditioning paradigm has been offered as the knowledge of conditioning of emotions and attitudes have grown. Indeed, the case of little Albert, or of your daughter, is an example of phobia made into the child through classical conditioning. Phobia and other anxiety disorders are sometimes explained by the principles of classical conditioning. Another common example of classical conditioning may be enuresis. Enuresis means inability to control urination in older children or adults, especially during sleep. You may interpret enuresis as inadequate bodily conditioning to wake up when the bladder is full. Normally we are conditioned to wake up when urination is about to take place. For the patient of enuresis this conditioning might be absent or faulty. If this explanation is accepted, you can plan treatment of enuresis by establishing classical conditioning. Actually that is what the doctors suggest for treating enuresis. The standard instruction by the doctor to family members is to awaken the patient at fixed times during the night and take her to the toilet. Gradually the patient becomes conditioned to wake up after the specific time interval following going to bed. Other examples may be obtained from the group of somatoform disorders. Take somatoform pain disorder as an instance. You may recall your school friend who always suffered from a stomach ache whenever she had to attend the class of a particular teacher. Of course, the teacher and some of the classmates also considered it a faint complaint. Yet you remember how she always vouched for the stomach ache to be a real one. One possibility is that she had some repeated unpleasant. 13. Learning and Cognitive Theories of Personality Encounters with the teacher, the tension associated in those instances caused severe gastric contraction in her for a few times. Then it got conditioned to the teacher's presence, and each time she had to encounter this teacher, she felt the gastric contraction, even though the events for tension were absent. You must remember that while the explanation by classical conditioning may be tenable in some instances of psychopathology, in most cases, the causes are much more complex. However, attempt to treat such pathologies with deconditioning of faulty acquisition and counter conditioning in a desirable manner has been successful at least partially in treatment of such disorders. In the next section we shall get acquainted with such principles of psychotherapeutic intervention based on classical conditioning. 1.5 Application of Classical Conditioning in Psychotherapy Let us discuss the therapeutic techniques that utilize the principles of classical conditioning. The most well-known application is in case of systematic desensitization. Consider a case of phobia. In phobia, as in case of little Albert, the person is irrationally afraid of certain neutral things. You may assume that the fear is the result of some kind of classical conditioning. Therefore the principles of extinction and counter conditioning may be used to free the person from the irrational fear. The technique of systematic desensitization was introduced by a psychologist named Joseph Walt 1915-1997. In this technique, the subject is exposed to the object of fear in a graded manner. Suppose, as in Albert's case, the rat is the object of irrational fear. As therapist you must design a step-by-step -step exposure to rat. Initially you may show him a picture of the rat from a distance and ensure he is fully relaxed. When the picture is acceptable to the child and he is relaxed enough, a plastic model of rat may be shown to him. Him. Gradually you may try a live rat, but from a distance so that the child is not traumatized. When the child accepts the rat at a distance, you may gradually think of bringing it closer to him. This is utilization of the principle of extinction.
but your work will be facilitated if you also associate something pleasant with the rat. For example, every time the picture of the rat is shown to the child, you may offer him a candy. The child will learn to associate rat with something pleasant. Thus along with extinction, you may also utilize the principle of counter-conditioning. Sir, what is conditioning? Classical conditioning has been criticized for providing a mechanical view of human behavior. It ignores the role of cognitive factors in learning. There are ample evidences that cognitive factors like motivation, expectation and attitudes help or hinder learning. Particularly in the case of human beings, cognitive factors are of immense importance. In fact, it has been observed that if a stimulus is well exposed to the animal or human before conditioning, then it cannot be used easily as a conditioned stimulus CS. That is already formed, attitudes, hinder its use as a CS. Thus classical conditioning is not as simple and mechanistic as it seems. Consider the case of the child suffering from oppositional defiance disorder. The aggressive motive of the child may far surpass the impact of simple reinforcements and the disruptive behavior continues till the cognitive and affective parts are taken care of. Similarly, consider the case of physically challenged persons like Helen Keller who, by sheer motivation and grit succeeded to overcome the handicaps. Perhaps, the principles of classical conditioning are not adequate for explaining such cases. A second criticism has come from the strict biological standpoint. You cannot condition any species beyond its biological limitation. Furthermore, the biological instinct to survive interacts with the conditioning paradigm. It is easy to condition a person to hate and avoid specific food, but conditioning the same person to hate and avoid flowers would be much more difficult. One is biologically more predisposed to be afraid of poison food for basic survival reasons than of poison flowers. The critics assert that classical conditioning in such cases is just working on the biological predispositions. A third critique of application of classical conditioning has come from ethical perspective. There have been unconfirmed reports of classical conditioning being used unethically on war prisoners of different countries and unethical use of classical conditioning in advertisements. All of these criticisms point out correctly to the limitation of classical conditioning principles. But that hardly makes it redundant. In fact, in recent years, the interest in classical conditioning principles has been renewed, as it has been observed that our immunity system may be classically conditioned Adder and Cohen, 2001, Mimi, 2006, and therefore, these principles seem to have impact on our health. Classical conditioning by Pavlov, 15, Learning and Cognitive Theories of Personality, 16, 1.7 Let us some UP. What did we learn in this unit? We have learned about the concept of classical conditioning as the acquisition of a response to a neutral stimulus when the neutral stimulus has been associated temporarily with a stimulus that naturally elicits the specific response. In this context we have learned about the work experiment. We have learned that classical conditioning occurs for reflexes and is maintained by a CS-UCS bond in time, the UCS serving as the reinforcement. We have also covered the principles of classical conditioning, particularly extinction, spontaneous recovery, generalization and discrimination, and counter-conditioning. We have learned how emotions and social attitudes can be conditioned. In this context, we have read the experiment of Watson and Renner on Little Albert. Then we have learned how different psychopathological conditions can come about through classical conditioning and as examples we have discussed phobia, enuresis and somatoform disorders. We have learned how classical conditioning principles can be used for therapeutic purposes, through systematic desensitization and aversion therapy. Finally we have discussed the major critics of classical conditioning from cognitive, biological and ethical perspectives and have concluded that despite limitations, the significance of classical conditioning in human behavior cannot be denied. What?